Ah, hello and welcome. My name is Chris, the creator of Physio Friend, and today I just want to talk to you lot about Parkinson's. Um, just to make you a little bit more aware of the condition, some of the symptoms, some of the presentations, the way it affects life, and also a little bit about what you can do about Parkinson's. Well, firstly, Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative condition and it affects about 127,000 people in the UK. So that's about one in every 500 people. And for you to understand what Parkinson's is, you need to know a little bit about the anatomy of the brain. So firstly, um, in the brain you've got two hemispheres, the right and the left hemisphere and these are the parts of the brain that controls movement so the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body so within that region there's the motor cortexes and these motor cortexes is what actually produces the movement now hidden within the structures of the brain you have the basal ganglia now the basal ganglia is what helps to coordinate the movement so your basal ganglia within the brain is always communicating with the thalamus which also relays information to the hemispheres of the brain. So with Parkinson's um, there's two things to really understand. Um, Parkinson's is basically the loss of dopamine within the brain. So for someone to manifest the symptoms of Parkinson's you need about 80% loss of this neurotransmitter named dopamine. So a loss of dopamine within the brain causes the symptoms of Parkinson's. And also for you to have an understanding on what Parkinson's is, um, you can think of popular celebrities that's also had Parkinson's. So these can include celebrities such as Muhammad Ali, um, Michael J. Fox, and you've also got uh, Maurice from Earth, Wind and Fire, who's also um, had Parkinson's in his lifetime. Um, for anyone to manifest the symptoms of Parkinson's, there has to be an 80% loss of the neurotransmitter dopamine. And when we're looking at dopamine and the way it affects the brain, we're talking about two systems really. So we're talking about the direct loop and the indirect loop. So the direct loop within the brain helps to excite movement. The indirect loop of the brain inhibits movement. So I'll repeat that again. The direct loop excites movement. The indirect loop inhibits movement. So when we look at these loops, um, dopamine plays a special role. So when dopamine is added to the direct loop, it helps to excite the movement. Interesting enough, dopamine in the indirect loop, remember the indirect loop inhibits movement, dopamine in the indirect loop helps to stop the inhibition of movement that the indirect loop creates. For you to get this in more content or just to understand it with more clarity, you can check out um, the little link at the bottom of the page to help you understand more of what the direct and the indirect loop does. So when we look at the symptoms of Parkinson's, we're talking, we can split it into two categories. We can split it into motor features and non-motor features. So motor features include things like bradykinesia, which is basically the slowness of movement that people see in Parkinson's. So that can also include freezing, and basically what freezing is, is the difficulty for Parkinson's patients, Parkinson's people, to initiate movement. So this can be um, when they're faced with more complex tasks, and they're not too sure how to process um, what they should do in their brain. So it 
looks as if they're freezing and they're trying to produce a step but they just can't do that they just don't know how to and those pathways are just not being sent through the brain to allow them to do that you can also get um, symptoms such as um, rigidity so this is like the stiffness in the trunk and um, difficulty turning um, because of the stiffness in the trunk and also this rigidity the stiffness in the trunk can make a Parkinson's patient more prone to falling because they haven't actually got that range so they haven't got their limit of stability is actually reduced so when I'm talking about limit of stability it's really seeing how far they can push themselves or stretch out of their base of support before they lose their balance so another symptom of Parkinson's is also it affects their posture so because of the rigidity their posture can be influenced in a manner where they're leaning to one side um, their posture can also be affected, they become more flexed and also with that flexion of the posture we get the flexion in the knees, we get the flexion in the back which also limits their balance and stability. With Parkinson's you can also get the festinating gait so when I'm saying festinating gait I'm actually talking about the shuffling steps and the reduced um, stride length and also that makes them more prone to tripping more prone to falling as well other um, symptoms of Parkinson's include non-motor features so this can include things like drooling um, this can also include symptoms like having a masked face um, finding it difficult to smile um, they also lack expression as well so they might appear serious all the time when that's not the case um, the case is they just find it difficult to move the um, facial muscles to produce um, expressions so um, with falling and Parkinson's um, some of the other non-motor features which can present this um, problem is um, the postural hypotension so this is um, the lowering of the blood pressure so um, people with Parkinson's may find that when they're getting out of bed in the morning they might feel more dizzy and also because of, of the low blood pressure they might be prone to falling or collapsing, fainting also known as syncope from simple activities such as getting out of a chair so anything that will change the blood pressure and make the blood pressure fall towards gravity as they move can pre present a problem and make people with Parkinson's fall. Diagnosing Parkinson's does present a lot of challenges to healthcare professionals such as neuroconsultants, physiotherapists, nurses and anyone else working with Parkinson's patients. And the reason for this is some of these Parkinson's features, also known as Parkinsonism features, they can also present itself in other conditions. And these other conditions can be things like Huntington's disease or even small vessel disease. So before a diagnosis of Parkinson's can be made, it should follow generally three principles. Um, one of the first principles is for there to be a diagnosis of Parkinson's there's got to be bradykinesia which is slowness of movement so if there is no slowness of movement then likelihood um, it's not Parkinson's and um, the second step is to rule out any other conditions which may present with Parkinsonism features such as cerebral vascular disease or small vessel disease and Huntington's disease and other neurological conditions and the third thing is really just to gain information supportive information as to why this could be Parkinson's so this can be asking the patient further on you know their daily activities how it's affected them when does their symptoms present most of the times
there is research out there which um, is trying to find out the cause of um, Parkinson's but to date um, none of the evidence is conclusive so um, with Parkinson's there has been general patterns that people found and that includes um, mostly Parkinson's happen with people over the age of 65 however there is cases where Parkinson's have been found in younger people in their 30s and 40s people like Michael um, J Fox and Muhammad Ali is evident to that um, also there's Parkinson's societies out there with which helps a lot of young people dealing with Parkinson's which is evident to the amount of young people having Parkinson's out there also um, the cause is unknown however there's been research which suggests that environmental factors can play a part in Parkinson's but however that's not totally conclusive to date. Hey, so you might be asking what can you do about your Parkinson's? Well um, firstly um, physiotherapy there's lots of research to show that, that you know it does help and it does have a big impact on people with Parkinson's and that's really the exercise component of physiotherapy exercise um, helps to maintain the muscle strength it helps to maintain a person balance it helps to reduce the uh, um, stiffness that um, Parkinson's patients may feel um, physiotherapy itself can help in um, assessments whereby specialised equipment is provided to Parkinson's patients which will help them with their everyday activities whether it's standing from a chair, getting on and off the toilet, getting in and out of the bed safely. Medication has been proven to work well with um, Parkinson's and from my observation as a physiotherapist working within the hospital, working within patients' homes, you can really see a difference with how um, Parkinson's medication helps to compensate for the loss of dopamine within the brain and help to produce natural movement. Um, there are side effects of these medications and that's why when people with Parkinson's are placed on medications, they're continually um, monitored and continually assessed to see what medication works best for these um, Parkinson's patients. Right, so a big thank you for tuning in. Um, there's more information on Parkinson's on my website www.physiofriend that's physiofriend, not friends, but friend without an S, .co.uk uh, You can also um, follow me on Twitter which is at physiofriend.